Hello my pooligans, I'm Chewie of the Mana Pool, and this is the final part of the JWST appreciation stream that Clues and I did. In part one, we gave a brief history of the paradigm shifts in astronomy that led up to the JWST. In part two, we looked at the telescope itself, explaining what it is, where it is, and why it is. And in part three, we looked at the first batch of images that were released, and explained what was in each one and why that was absolutely mind-blowing. I highly recommend you check all those out if you haven't yet. There's a playlist link up here in the corner right now. Part four here is more of a potpourri of JWST stuff. The one labeled MISC, if you will. We'll get into the other major function of the JWST beyond pretty space pictures, which is spectroscopy. This is where the real science comes from. We'll do one last comparison with the Hubble and what that difference could potentially mean for the future. We'll take a look at the JWST test images of Jupiter, which are pretty neat. We'll cover the big controversy with the telescope's name. And we really wish it was called something else. And we'll even answer a live question about what we would point the telescope at if we had free reign. And now that you know what you're in for, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to part four. Take a deep breath, because this is the deep end. Jam. Dum 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 jam! Now, from how much the light that we see from these galaxies, we can look for features in them. We can look for chemical fingerprints in them. And if we look to see how much those specific chemical features have been shifted, how much they've been redshifted, because remember way back, like an hour ago, hour and a half, hour and 40 minutes ago, um, I mentioned that Hubble noticed that the further something was away from us, or the further something was away from us, the faster it was moving away from us. Mm -hmm. Well, they've done some spectra of some of these little background galaxies that you see deep inside of this image. So if we go to uh, the next image that we have, we have a few spectra of some of those background galaxies. And we use that to try and figure out how far away these things are, the stuff that's been gravitationally lensed. And so what you're seeing on the left is that image that we were just looking at. Mm -hmm. And there are four specific galaxies that they've picked out and they put little boxes around. And then over on the right hand side, they're showing you some chemical fingerprints and we're seeing how those have been shifted. So stuff that is a mere 11 billion <laughs> light years away, you can see features for hydrogen and oxygen. I believe, at least I think that's hydrogen and oxygen that we have there. Yeah, yeah there we go. And if we go to a galaxy that's further away, say 12.6 billion years, 12.6 uh, billion light years away, you'll see those same features are shifted to the right. They're shifted to the red. Yeah. Well, if we keep going forward with this, there is one spot toward the bottom. So go drop to the bottom galaxy for me. Oh, I There's can't. this one there we go. little <laughs> tiny red dot of a galaxy. Hang on, let me, let me turn myself and off. And its, it's features are shifted so far to the right, that galaxy is 13.1 billion light years away. That means that we're seeing this galaxy as it existed 13.1 billion years ago. Now, here's why that's important. Here's why that's even crazier than you might think it is. We believe the universe to be approximately 13.6-ish billion years old, maybe 13.8, somewhere in there. There's a little bit of argument that I don't want to go into right now, but let's just call it like 13.8 billion light years, or billion years old. Yeah. This galaxy was formed in the first billion years of the universe. Hang on, let me see if we I can are looking that one. in this image at one of the earliest galaxies ever formed. Right there. That little red smudge. That little red smudge right there is one of the earliest galaxies that was ever formed. So with astronomy, the further out we're looking, the further back in time we're looking, we are seeing 
one of the earliest generations of galaxies. This little smudge that you're seeing right there and the spectrum that went with it that we just saw on the other image, in truth, that's really why the JWST was built. That's yeah. really why we did that. That we needed an instrument that could try and see back to that first generation of stars, that first generation of galaxies, so that we can figure out how the universe came from what it was to what it is. We know what it looks like now, because we can look at the stuff nearby. With an instrument like the JWST, we can look at how it was 13 point some billion years ago, uh, and we can try and reconstruct how we think the universe evolved. Because um, without getting too deep into things, because, uh, man, this could open a whole can of worms that we don't have time for, but without getting too deep into things, when the universe began, it was basically hydrogen and helium. That's it. Yeah. Anything else that we have came from the heart of a star. It came from one of those cycles where one of those clouds of gas, like the Carina Nebula, collapsed into stars. Those stars lived, they died, and when they died, they expelled their contents back out into space, and then we made the ge next generation of stars, and then we did it again and made the next generation of stars. So this galaxy, 13.1 billion years ago, it already contains oxygen. So very quickly after the beginning of the universe, uh, we had the first generation of stars uh, live and die. Now, again, that's a terrible oversimplification of a lot of things, but we don't have time to get into the, you know, the, 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 the deep details of all of that. Yeah. The idea but, here is to help everyone understand the scale of things we're talking about here and why this is so incredible. And, and why yeah. all of your astronomer friends are just losing their damn mind over yeah. everything that comes off of JWST. So... Uh, that's also why we chose to go from the closest stuff out so we could get to this one. But now that we've talked a little bit about spectroscopy, I do want to talk about something a little closer to home. I want to talk about one more result that was released that, you know, all these beautiful pictures, they're amazing. And as, as I described it to Chewy, they pay the bills, right? The, the general public loves to see the pretty pictures. Heck, I love to see the pretty pictures. And there's tons of science in those pretty pictures. The colors do mean things, and mm -hmm. the colors do bring out details that we're not aware of before. But here is another example of James Webb's capabilities just to show you what all it can do. It is not a one-trick pony. It's not a two-trick pony. It's like a 50-trick pony. This is an observation of the atmosphere of a planet around another star. So this is the planet WASP-96b, and you're going to go, that's a neat name. What is that from? Well, WASP stands for the Wide Angle Search for Planets, because mm -hmm. we like our acronyms. And this particular star that we're looking around is the 96th star in that WASP catalog. And we're looking at the first planet that was found around that star, thus the B. WASP A is the star. WASP B is its first planet. Yeah. And so what they did is they waited for the planet to go in front of the star. And when it did, some of the light from the star shone through the atmosphere of the planet and then came to us. Yep. And so this spectrum that you're seeing on the screen, the bumps and wiggles in this spectrum tell you about the chemical composition of the atmosphere ar around the planet, around the star. And this planet is about 1,150 light years from Earth, so 1,150 light years from Earth. And we were able, without going there, without touching it, we were able to discern that in its atmosphere is water. H2O, the yep. stuff of life, the stuff that we're always searching for uh, uh, in, in other planets. And in fact, the exact shapes of these bumps and wiggles where the H2O is, where the water is, we know from their shapes that this is not liquid water, it's water vapor. Yep. So there is water vapor, there is steam in the atmosphere of this planet. Now, that shouldn't surprise us that it's steam, because if you want to know some more details about this WASP-96b system, um, this gas giant, which is probably about the size of Jupiter, is orbiting extremely close to its star. So it's, it's closer to its star than Mercury is to the sun. Yeah. So it's no surprise that the water that is there is water vapor. But this kind of stuff, the spectra 
that are coming off of JWST. These spectra are going to tell us so much more than any of the pictures can. And the pictures are going to tell us so much more than any of the pictures we've had up until now can. So for the scientists, this kind of stuff and the spectra in the, the, the SMACS image, those are the most important things coming off of the JWST. They're the most exciting things coming like, off of JWST. Like for scientists and actual science. But they're also the hardest to explain to people. Yeah. Which is why, from a PR standpoint, instead of immediately releasing this and going, hey, look at what the JWST can do, and everybody going, we spent $10 billion on what? We got we lines and squiggles. We instead released a suite of images yeah. that could really explore the parameter space of everything that the JWST is capable of. Um, and they're just getting started, right? I mean, this is real early days kind of stuff. Um, it is going to continue for years, hopefully a couple of decades, to give us more and more information. And it's why I mentioned all those turning points, those milestones of us mm -hmm. figuring out what our place in the universe really is. The JWST is a complete uh, another step in that direction, another rung on that ladder, another uh, watershed moment. So I, I want you to really remember this time. This is exciting. This is like discovering a new planet exciting. This is really changing how the universe, our understanding of the universe and our place in it. Um, so so here, a question was asked, uh, how often are photos coming in from JST or JWST? The answer is all the time. Um, but they do take time to process. So how often will you see them? I don't know the answer to that. It depends on the exact science program that's doing it. But I would expect that every few months, you're probably going to get some announcement. Eventually, you're going to get jaded. And like a year or two from now, you're going to get bored with the results that are coming. Well, maybe not you specifically. The media is going to get yeah. bored with the results coming from JWST. Yeah. It, it happened I don't with want the that to happen to you guys. Now, here here's the, the last of the web compare images. This was the 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 SWAX image, the best we had from Hubble, which is still amazing. It's, it's, um, yeah, it is absolutely ridiculous. But then when you slide the slider, it's just like, okay, where, where was the smudge? So there is, is the 13.1 billion one. Whoop, it's not there. <laughs> and in yeah. fact, there's a lot that's not there. We just can't resolve, uh, invisible light and, uh, what not, but with the, uh, the JWST, like where, where's my favorite mirrored, uh, galaxy here? Like we could, s we could see it, but it's, it's, oh, look at the resolution. Yeah. Oh my God. I'm dying here. It's just, it's just amazing. Just amazing. What like, the JWST yeah, this, does. this little s smudge right here that looks like nothing it is, look at all the structure we can see. And that's as far in as this image will zoom, so I can't get all up in there. But yeah, this this weird little blue whoop that nope galaxy. <laughs> no, so, when when in doubt, looking at a jet oh galaxy. Yep. Yeah. Galaxy. Now the other thing that blew me away about the JWST, okay, the Hubble Deep Field. Uh the way that worked is they would point oh, the Hubble. Yeah. Do what? No, no, no. I, I know where you're going with oh, this. Okay. Please continue. Yeah. They, they would point the Hubble at the uh, the spot in the sky for as long as they could until, you know, Earth revolved or whatever. And then they would point it at it again the next chance they got. And it took uh, the total exposures. Now, exposure is literally like, like with a camera, because it is a camera. Uh, you're opening the shutter and letting the light hit the sensor for a long amount of time and with the hubble deep field it took it was like 11 days worth that was of exposure with the, yeah that was the original deep field by the yeah. time they got to the extreme deep field it was something like 28 days yeah. worth of exposure now that's that not one spot that's not 11 days total that's 11 days of the shutter being open so it took months yeah to, to get this 
this image of the of Swax here with this insane resolution. Twelve and a half hours. Like it's 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 an order of magnitude almost difference. We got an image that is so much better and so much clearer and has so much more resolution and shows so much more. And it took a tiny fraction. And because of this this ridiculous turnaround, like time on the Hubble clues was hard to get and super valuable, right? Oh yes, it's still oversubscribed right now. And when I say time on the Hubble, I mean you you have to write your proposal and get it approved and then uh yeah. That, it's, that's it's another a whole big thing. That's another thing we should mention here is okay, so you guys have this fancy space telescope. Who decides to get to gets to use it? And the answer is a panel of scientists do. So you you yeah. make a proposal, you submit that proposal to what's called the time allocation committee or the TAC. Yep. And uh, if your proposal is uh, deemed good enough by essentially a, a group of your peers, you'll be granted some time to take that data. And once they take the data for you, because this is a government funded project, uh, that data is yours to publish and to uh, do your research with uh, for a certain amount of time. I don't know what the, the deal is with, with JWST. I believe with Hubble, uh, it's yours uh, for a year. And then after that year, you have to make it publicly available so other people could use that work as well. Uh, and so all of the major telescopes work that way, that uh, yeah. they do have a, a public data policy. But with, like... <sighs> Uh, so question it's, in the chat. Uh, so this is an important point. This is not the Hubble deep field that we're looking at. No, this is a different no. field. This is, this is that, that SMACS galaxy cluster. Uh, someone asked, uh, do we know if they're going to do uh, the deep field experiment? I suspect it's only a matter of time before they do use the JWST to point at the Hubble deep field. Um, I don't know that they're in the right position in the sky right now. I don't know this is the right time of year for them to actually hit uh, the, the, the deep field field, um, because the deep field itself is in the big dipper. Yeah. Um, it's, it's actually off, off to one spot in the big dipper where there's an empty spot in space, but I'm, I'm confident that that picture will come. Oh yeah. Uh, I don't have official word that is just based on, on my, my, uh, it, it's just good PR if nothing else. Like, yeah. Like, hey, you remember the Hubble deep field and ultra deep field and extreme deep field? Look at this. And Look it'll blow this. our minds again. Yeah. Oh, um, and incidentally, here's a fun factoid that I found out just the other day. Um, did you know that on board the JWST, it contains a whopping uh, 68 gig uh, SSD? So basically the hard drive on the JWST is 68 gigs. That's it. That's all the data capacity that it has. It is roughly a day's worth of observations. And then it beams them back during the four and a half hour window that it's aligned with antennas on Earth that we can, we can send the data back. And you might ask, why did they put such a crappy hard drive on there? Uh, the answer is they had to build a, a hard drive, an SSD, a, a solid state drive, that they knew would last for 20 years of constant use in space at a crazy low temperature. And so that was the biggest capacity they could make that they were certain would work long enough. Also, uh, radiation. Uh, yeah, also radiation. Yeah. Also radiation. But, um, um the, yeah, okay, I before, have, uh, before you answer that question, let me, let me go back sure. to the, the point I was making earlier. Great, great, great. Yeah. Since the, the JWST has to put it like, a really, really inaccurate and stupid way. It can see faster. <laughs> uh, I, I'm, I'm fully convinced that not only, and now I'm stealing this from Joe Scott, I think is his name. Uh, I, uh, and I, when he said that it, it clicked, he's a YouTuber. Uh, we're going to have like generations of discoveries from, this telescope because the, the, the time is so low to get amazing images that we're going to be getting more images faster. And 
because it's got its 20 year lifespan, you know, that means we're, we're going to keep getting more data. And it means with, with more people able to do more things, it's going to build on itself faster than the Hubble could. Am I making sense here? Yeah. It's, it's essentially, it's, it's an, it's an exponential speed up in yeah. the rate at which things are going to be discovered. Um, the, the other thing I'll say is, and here's the thing that I love so much about astronomy. Some people might find it infuriating, but I absolutely adore it. There are many things I like about astronomy. I'm an astronomer. I'm going to be one when I grow up, I swear, as soon as I actually figure out how to grow up. Um, He's a Toys R Us kid. A hey, Toys R Us is coming back, buddy, or at least so I've been told. That's but what not, I heard. Not really. Um, here's the thing about astronomy. There are things that I learned when I was in undergrad, that I learned when I was in grad school. There are things that I taught to my students just a couple of years ago yeah. that we're going to discover are wrong. Mm -hmm. We're going to learn new things. It's going to fundamentally alter our understanding about how the universe operates. And I find that exciting to know that I've been wrong about something for years, to know that the information I had was incomplete and we have learned something more and it's changed our understanding. And I think that that is absolutely amazing. Astronomy is a constantly evolving field and we learn new things every single day. And that's exciting to me. Now, there was a question that came by earlier about a picture that went viral recently about Aurora on Jupiter. I have not seen the viral information about the Aurora on Jupiter. Jupiter does have Aurora. Mm -hmm. um, we're like way over the time we were gonna do this, but I just wanna throw in there that uh, if we wanna look real close to home, uh, JWST, while it was in engineering, did take some images of some nearby stuff, including an asteroid, but also including Jupiter. So here is an infrared image of Jupiter taken by uh, the JWST. And so you're seeing essentially the heat of Jupiter. The, the, the different cloud bands are at different temperatures. In this case, because they're at different depths in Jupiter's atmosphere, which is pretty awesome and pretty sweet. Mm -hmm. But if you go forward one more image, this is another image uh, taken in a different set of wavelengths. And first of all, the bright thing off to the left, that's one of Jupiter's moons. So one of the Galilean moons of Jupiter. But I want you to look very carefully in the background here. There is a thin ring around Jupiter. Do you see the thin ring there around Jupiter? Jupiter has rings. Now, that's a thing that a lot of people don't know. Uh, yeah. A lot of scientists do, astronomers definitely know it. Yeah. All of the gas giants had rings. We didn't know that they had rings until we sent the Voyager space probes yeah. out there that were launched in the 1970s, but we can see them with JWST. Now notice also this black thing that's here. This black thing that's here is not aliens. This is a defect. This is an error that happened in the image. This is the kind of stuff that they clean up when yeah. they're combining multiple images. Yeah, together. all of this, this schmutz here is not on my monitor like I originally thought. And, and this black piece here, like you can see there, these black smudges, whoops, these black smudges are in both images. Yeah, so that's, that's fact, on the detector. Out, you can make out the defect in this image too, it's right there. Yeah. So, yeah. So the way we fix that is you take multiple images with the, the object in slightly different places and then you combine them after the fact. Uh, and so those are the kinds of, this is what a raw image would look like. Okay, it will have all of these defects. It'll have all of like these problems. All of these lines. And, and we try and clean them up before we, before we put yeah. them out. It's not that we're Photoshopping over them to make them look pretty. It's that we lost data because there's an error in the, in the, the, the image or in the camera itself. And so we have to move the object a little bit, take an image and then combine them to fill in those areas that, that have the, the, the bad parts. Yeah. So, so there you go. Uh, that's kind of all the gushing we want to do, I think, about, uh, about the JWST. So I, I hope you all enjoyed this journey with us. And we, I hope that you... We did not bring uh, up the bad part. Which bad part? The name. Oh, yeah, I suppose we should mention that. I meant to, I meant to do it at the very beginning. 
Um, I didn't think about it until we were halfway through uh, yeah. Stefan's quintet. So yeah, yeah. I, I I try my best not to use the full name for the JWST. Uh, it, yeah. It's it, it is named after uh, an individual who was the head of NASA for uh, a, a while. Um, feel free to do some digging on your own, but there are some problematic things about that individual. And there are those who do not believe that this telescope should have been named after that individual because of those problematic issues. Um, what Clues is not saying, because Clues is a sweetheart, is that he was a raging homophobe and we kind of hate him. Well, that the problem is he may have been a raging homophobe. Sorry, he, there's there's certainly seems evidence to, to, to suggest that. Yeah. <laughs> and the real key, the real reason why so many people, myself included, are, are kind of upset at the naming is we don't feel that, that the folks who named the telescope, the, the, the folks inside of NASA, not NASA as a whole, but the folks inside of NASA who decided to name it that way, uh, they really didn't do their due diligence on choosing that name. They didn't get enough input from the community when they were giving it that name. And when they were challenged on it, they did the most cursory, no, everything is fine sort of investigation. Yeah. And so uh, there is a movement to try and get it renamed to something else. And uh, I would be happy with that. Uh, I'm happy to go back to the next generation space telescope. That would be um, cool. That would be just fine. Um, but yeah, uh, it, it would be, we would be remiss if we didn't at least mention that that yeah. is uh, a like, something to be. Aware. That's why, like, I'm I'm tempted to call it the web because the name it, it the web it's so it's it's cute it's quick you know what I mean, but I don't wanna. Yeah. And so we're stuck with JWST, which does not roll. Despite what Clue says, the more you say it, it does not roll better. Well, I I think it does roll better. It never rolls well. I'm not making that. Clear. Oh yeah, okay. I'm just saying that it does. I, roll I recommended better. the the J -wist. But Clues didn't like that. I kind of like yeah. it. The new J-West image it seems nice. It rolls better yeah, it's, than JWST. It's not awful. I, I like it. I like it better than I did when I first heard it. Yeah. Like, That's what I'll say. Well, I have seen Joust. No. I've seen Juiced. No. No. <laughs> no. But yeah, we would we would be remiss if we did not bring that up. As awful <laughs> we, as it is. Okay. How, how about Webigail? From Webigail. Uh, Ooh. Yeah, from DuckTales. Ooh, Mike said, how about J-Dub? Nah, J-Dub. <laughs> J-Dub. Did you catch that new J-Dub single? I mean, image. <laughs> Just came off. So, yeah, I hope, for for those of you who just were like, oh, it's cute. You know, when you saw uh, this image that, <laughs> frankly, I'm, look, I'm tearing up just thinking about it again. Like, it, it gave me what... A, what I can only assume is what other people would call a religious experience, which I don't have. So like to, to see people go, Oh, that's cool. And that's it. It's like, Oh, Oh, don't, Oh, you must be because you don't understand the, just the breadth of what we're dealing with here. <laughs> and that's why I wanted to do this. And who better to get than one of my good friends who is an actual astronomer. Um, and I wanted to just explain why this is all so significant. And it's an abs. It's not, it is pretty pictures, but it's not just pretty pictures. This is a watershed moment in science and our understanding of the universe and the actual cost of this. Again, we said it's $10 billion, but it's $10 billion over 30 years, which means it's virtually nothing. Yeah. It's, and, a, it's a drop in the bucket and it's unlocking our understanding of the entire universe. Yeah. Plus I'm sure we'll get some from the technology that had to be invented to actually create the, uh, the J dub and get it out there. I'm sure that from that technology, we'll get other things that are more practical as people would say. Yeah. Yeah. The, the example I always like to give, cause people do ask, Oh, well then what's the point in all of this? Like, what do we gain? Uh, Hey, do you like having a, a cell phone in your camera? Or, or I'm sorry, a camera in your cell phone. <laughs> Either way. So the, cell phone surprisingly, in your camera, I think was something they tried before and didn't work. Didn't work. <laughs> yeah. The surprisingly useful rectangle that you carry around. Do, do you know why that camera exists? Uh, it's, it's because we used them to make astronomical images. Yeah. They, 
it, 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 was, it was astronomers who really exploited that technology and really pushed it to where, where it is now. Um, do you like uh, really cheap, really dense storage? Like, like having, you know, hundreds of gigabytes on something the size of your fingernail? Yeah, do you know who really pushes yeah, the envelope of data like storage? That, that's astronomers. Um, so we, we really do push a lot of uh, the edges of what technology is capable of um, as we do these things. So uh, on the one hand, there's no like direct result of the JWST. It doesn't make your life better today in any way. But the kinds of problems we need to overcome advances technology in ways that, that aren't easy to capture. Uh, oh, a question came up about the cosmological constant. We have not yet resolved that. It is still an ongoing argument. And for those who don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry. I'm sure some JWST uh, results will help us with that, I hope. At, at some I point hope. in the future, surely, right? Uh, yes, and don't call me Shirley. I... As clues, I just want to tell you, we're all counting yeah. on you. Good luck. <laughs> I just want to tell you both. Good luck. We're all counting on you. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I hope I hope that you all learned a little something from uh, from from this yeah. tonight. If nothing else, just a little more appreciation. Anytime you see images like this come along, like even if you're just like, oh, pretty picture. Even if you don't know the science behind it, please, 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 I'm just begging you. Like, take a minute. Just take like take thirty seconds, and look at it and contemplate the hundreds of person hours that went into making that image and the technology that it takes to, to make those images. Uh, there, there's, there's so much that we learn from all of these things. Um, so uh, take time to appreciate the, 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 the universe that is literally hidden in plain sight, right? It's, it's right there. And if you just have the right instruments and the right understanding, you can unlock the beginnings of everything like this little red smudge right here <laughs> yep so yeah that's why the the hashtag the pr thing that they've been using for the 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 j-dub i really like that is uh unfolding the universe because unfolding like the telescope itself had to do while it was going out there but also that's literally what we're doing is uh, unfolding the universe before our very eyes and oh i love it so yeah so there you if, go. whether you learned anything about the actual astronomy or not is one you know completely irrelevant but hopefully you you gained an appreciation for what is going on here which was my entire goal <laughs> so yay well, Clues, I love you, my friend. Thank you so much for oh, thank you for having me being to, the professor. to have this conversation. It's been great. And it's been great. thank you all for... Oh, there was one more question. If you could get uh, JWST time yourself, what would you point it at? Yeah, see, that's the problem. I look at stuff that's so much closer than this. That This is, this is like using... Uh, uh, I don't know, a tank to step on an ant for the kinds of stuff that I do. Uh, so I, I do not know. If, if I had my druthers, I would use it to, to replicate the Hubble Deep Field experiment just, just to have that comparison. Um, but so. most of my stuff is all uh, galact inside of the galaxy for, for astronomy, and I don't, I don't need a gun this big. Oh, well, for me then, what I would point it at Hang on, open image in new tab. I would point it at this. Ah, this is and always has been my favorite galaxy. <laughs> this, do you know what this is, Clues? I don't remember its name offhand, but uh, this is I... Centaurus A. Yeah. Which is NGC 5328, 5238, something like that. And it was known as the Irregular Galaxy for a long or as the poster child of the irregular galaxies because like what you're seeing here is not what i saw uh as as a kid like nope. we didn't have the the resolution for this this jet of uh stuff here being expelled by that might be in the foreground no i don't think it is uh no that's that's most likely from the jet yeah uh, there there's probably an active active and, nuclear and we there. didn't have this it was just this weird 
black smudge like when I first saw it. As a matter of fact, hold, hold everything. Stand by as we retrieve a worse picture. Yeah. Um, is, is it on the cover of one of your... Uh... It's an Audubon Society uh, field guide to the night sky. Oh, sure. Okay, here we go. It, it, no, we're still in the M's. Uh, yeah, I, Pinball Witch, I believe the plan is to uh, probably break this up into a couple of videos and post them on YouTube. So uh, here we when, go. Yeah. when they get this, posted, I'm sure uh, Chewy will let us know. This is what we could get back in the day. This was MG, NGC 5128, sorry. And when I saw this image of a smudge with a bizarre black streak across it, I was like, what is, what is, the, what is the story here? And this is now one of the better images that we've gotten. And in fact, I can't get it out, but in, in my backdrop over here, uh, one year for my birthday, uh, Lex, when we were still together, my, an old girlfriend asked me, hey, what's your favorite galaxy? And I was like, I don't know, Centaurus A? She's like, what? And it turns out why was because there was a guy who had a telescope who would take pictures and frame them for you. And it's back there on my nerd wall behind me, my backdrop. So it's it's very much a little smudge with a black streak across it. But this is what I would point it at. I want to see what's behind all that dust in the infrared. And I'm sure someone will at some point. So uh, la last in the chat, uh, last 1031 has asked, will they be able to take an image of the supermassive black hole in the center of our galaxy? I am certain that they will point it at the center of our galaxy. Uh, you need even oh, yeah. longer wavelengths than this to really get down to the center of our galaxy because there's so much dust and gas between here and there. Um, that is yeah. a spot called Sagittarius A star. So as Pinball Witch points out there, I'm certain that they'll point it there at some point, but our best picture of that black hole is still going to be uh, what was constructed with the Event Horizon Telescope that was released, I think, last year. They right, got the image year, of, year of, before, of our own. Um, the year Something before, like I think they got uh, M87's black hole because they did that one first. It was actually easier to image a black hole outside of our own galaxy than yes. to image the one inside of our own galaxy because it was a bigger black hole. Um, yeah. And actually, now that you brought that up, Chewy, I think what I might actually image if they said, hey, Clues, what can we, what can we point the JWST at for you? I would probably say uh, NGC 5548. Uh, and the reason for that is it is a radio galaxy. It's an active galactic nuclei, and it's what I did my thesis work on. And so I would like a JWST 55, image of that. NGC 5548, yeah. Images. I mean, in, in most images I've seen, it pretty much just looks like a dot. It is not all that impressive. But I haven't looked lately, so. Wait, you said, you said 5548, right? 5548, NGC okay. 5548. Well, apparently they've gotten something much bigger now because... Have they, uh, got, have they gotten better? I'm not sure. Like I said, I haven't looked in a while because this uh, my thesis was a traumatic experience. So, yeah, yeah, the, there you go. Yeah, this, this okay, is what I'm that's seeing better. now. That's better, yeah. I'd, I'd point the JWST at that. But, like, you can tell from there's no uh, definition here and you can see all of the, the fuzzy bits. I'm guessing that this is zoomed in from a much smaller image yeah it, pro it probably is and that that's most likely ground-based i don't know if there are any hubble images of ngc oh okay well yeah this this doesn't have the hubble diffraction spike so you, you're probably right yeah it's it's a relatively obscure radio galaxy so nice so there you go so there thank you, you go. all for that that's what us that's what we would do on this journey <laughs> <laughs> so yeah thank you all Again, so very much for joining us, those of you watching live and those of you watching later on uh, YouTube or in the VOD or whatever. Um, Clues is at La Cluse, L-A-C-L-U-Y-Z-E. Huh? Correct. Thank you very much. On Twitter, and I am at the Manapool, of course. Uh, feel free to throw any questions you have at us there, or you can join the Discord and ask there, because uh, I live in the Discord because it's my Discord. And uh, if it's an answer, a question I can't answer, I will poke clues and get him to come in and answer it. I will do my best. Yeah. So with that, we will be done. We hope that we have helped unfold the universe for you just a little bit. Uh, thank you all so very much for joining us. Hey, there's the Lego Star Destroyer thing. Uh, thank you all so very much for joining us. And uh, go look up. 
Yeah. And that was it. How'd you like it? Clues and I were really excited to share our passion with a large audience, so we really hope you enjoyed it. And hey, maybe you learned something. If not, some of the more technical stuff about astronomy. The hope is that you now understand why all your space fan friends are consistently freaking out about the JWST and the images that get shown. There's a lot more to it than just the pretty space pictures, though they are really pretty. So that's it for the opening salvo of The Deep End. Please leave your complimentary arm floaties in the bin as you exit. And before you leave, be sure to subscribe because this is where the real game begins, as the kids don't <coughs> actually say. Now that the JWST stream is done, I'm going to be using The Deep End for scripted video essay types of things. Uh, for instance, the first one I have planned is a defense of the Legend of Zelda cartoon. Yes, that one. And hey, if you want to see it before anyone else and point out problems that I need to fix before it goes public, head over to patreon.com slash themanapool and become a lifeguard. And with that, we're done. I've been Chewy, waving and drowning, and this has been The Deep End. Thank you all so very much for watching, and uh, keep looking up. <laughs>